call to order the City of Douglasville City Council Legislative Work Session for tonight, which is Thursday, November the 17th, 2022. We'll have our invocation by Pastor Reverend Dr. Francisco Hartley of the po uh, Poseyville United Methodist Church. And after that, we'll have the uh, Pledge of Allegiance by the Mayor Pro Tem, Mayor Pro Tem, City Council Member Terry Miller. Please stand for the invocation. Good evening, Madam Mayor, City Council. Uh, this Sunday is um, Christ the King Sunday. It marks the end of the liturgical year for the church, but it's the Sunday that we celebrate the King of all kings, the ruler of all rulers, and our one and true leader of this country who, in this world, who came to earth, walked on this earth, and set example for all of us to live by, and that is Jesus. And so as leaders, Whenever we make a decision, we should turn to him for guidance and wisdom in our decisions. Uh, but I also like to say, I hope you all have a happy Thanksgiving, a happy holiday season, and a, and a wonderful Christmas. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you for this beautiful day that you have given us. And Lord, I just ask that you bless our city council and our mayor, and you bless the leaders in our city and in our towns and our country and this world, Lord, that we can all turn to you and look to you for wisdom and guidance. And Lord, I just ask blessings upon Douglasville. I ask blessings upon those that have come. And I just, Lord, I just thank you for all you do for us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands. Thank you so much, Mayor Pro Tem, for leading us in the pledge. And Dr. Hart Artley, we appreciate the invocation and the prayer that you've extended to us. I'd like to welcome you to the city of Douglasville for our uh, legislative work session. My name's Rochelle Robinson. I'm the mayor of the city of Douglasville. And tonight's meeting is being conducted, um, and it's just a work session, so information that we hear this evening, we will look at uh, to discuss and make decisions on Monday. So we are just here to... Um, hear the information and deliberate and take it into a work session uh, format. There won't be, this is not an official voting meeting. If the business you're here for is not listed as an agenda item, there will be ample time at the end of the meeting for comments from citizens and delegates for you to come forward and to discuss your business. I'll just go over a few protocol issues and we will jump right into the agenda, which is uh, printed outside, hard copies, or you can follow us on the screen above. This is a work session again, where agenda items are presented for discussion and no official action will be taken tonight. Um, I ask that you please keep your comments and presentations on a professional level dealing with the facts that are important for this governing body to make our decisions. Only one person speaking at a time when you come to the podium. Please give us your name and address for the record and you'll have five minutes to speak. Each person has five minutes and there is a portion where we have uh, zoning issues and there is 20 minutes for those in uh, favor of that item and 20 minutes for those in opposition and each person has five minutes or if you have more than four or five people you can split up the time but as long as totality is uh, 20 minutes per side. If you have any printed material, I'll ask that you would please give that to our assistant city clerk, uh, Ms. Candace Jackson, to my right, and she will uh, distribute that to us at a later time. I'll remind you that we're only required to accept public comments on zoning matters. If you have a cell phone or electronic device, please put those in silent mode so they will not be disruptive during the meeting. And uh, this is how the agenda items will be handled, and then we'll get right into the meeting. The committee chairperson or vice chair or someone representing that committee, since we have a few council members missing for the holidays, uh, that person, we would ask that you would please uh, present all of your questions to that person, read your agenda item, that person representing that agenda item or applicant will come forward, give us your name and address for the record, and then um, address all of your issues to the committee chairperson or representative. Myself and council members will possibly ask questions, clarifying questions to help us to get a better understanding so that we can deliberate, break up all the information and make our decision on next Monday. 
After that, the committee chairperson will ask for comments or statements from the audience, and that's when folks will come forward, and you'll have 20 minutes for those in favor, 20 minutes for those in opposition, and each person, each side will have an opportunity to talk. And Ms. Jackson is the timekeeper, so she'll tell us if we go beyond our time frame. Prior to approaching the podium, please give your card to Ms. Jackson uh, that has your name and address. And when you come forward, give us your name and address for the record. Each person has one opportunity to talk. This is not a question and debate uh, format. We're just here to gather information and make our decisions. So to help us make our decisions on Monday. So those are all the um, instructions. I know that's a lot of talking. Hopefully everyone is on the same page and we will move forward with our agenda. So we'll go on to, we don't have any announcements or presentations outside of what I've just given you. So we'll move on then to Economic Development Committee and that's chaired by Council Member Mayor Pro Tem Terry Miller. Thank you, Madam Mayor. We have one item tonight under the Economic Development Committee. Yes, sir. And that is to authorize the mayor to sign the joint tax incentives agreement with Douglasville Industrial LLC, Relish Labs LLC, and the De Development Authority for the City of Douglasville, Georgia. Breezy Stratton, Chris Pumphrey, and Chelsea Jackson will do our presentation. And I okay. will assume that all council members have gone through the 80 pages of the agreement <laughs> and know it by heart at this 80 point. 80 pages. Good evening, Mayor and Councils. So glad to be here with you this evening. Chris Pumphrey, Elevate Douglas Economic Partnership, mm -hmm. 8512 Bowden Street. Um, here before you tonight um, for uh, this agreement, we had the, the great time earlier today mm -hmm. uh, with the ribbon cutting and grand opening of the Home Chef uh, manufacturing facility uh, out on at 2120 Skyview mm -hmm. Road. Um, we've been working with the, on that project since sometime last year. And we've just been going through the, you all approved the project itself earlier this year. Mm -hmm. We're going through some of the formalities of that. This particular project had a building of about 183,000 square feet that was built by a developer by the name of Oakmont mm -hmm. uh, and um, Home Chef being the tenant of that building. And so the, the incentive is based on the fact that um, Home Chef is creating uh, over 700 new jobs into the community um, and uh, they are making an investment um, in the neighborhood of 24, 23 million dollars I believe um, and that Oakmont um, made an investment of roughly 13 million in the building of a speculative industrial building. Yeah. So the incentive is on the two of those but because they are two separate owners we're required to do two separate agreements. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we're here before you tonight. You've already approved the agreement that Home Chef has made mm -hmm. uh, on their job commitment and their investment. And this is just the agreement so basically solidifying that the building itself mm -hmm. will be a part of that same agreement. Um, and so um, this is that's what's before you this evening. The Development Authority uh, Board will be um, approving the bond resolution tomorrow morning so mm -hmm. that then they could go for validation and uh, have the project fully onto the tax incentive plan in 2023. Mm -hmm. okay. Is that it? That's it. Okay. Thank you. Well, I will open the floor to Mayor and Council. Any questions, Madam Mayor? Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Pumphreys. We appreciate the presentation. Um, I, um, the building is there. Uh, Council Member Estes and I were there today for the uh, ribbon cutting and of course I'm gonna put him on the spot again and say if you wanted to say anything about the building um, since this is the uh, the agreement for the the building I'm um, sure uh, yes we had a great time at the ribbon County today it's an incredibly mm -hmm. impressive facility and the people mm -hmm. that are running it and working there are equally impressive I think they are a fantastic addition Mm -hmm. to Douglasville yes, sir. Um, and that's about it it's great so thank you Chris for, for helping bring them thank you thank you so much thank you Mr. Mayor Pro Tem I just wanted to have uh, Councilman Estes in his ward and it was a great um, time today and it's cold in that one Very. area but <laughs> <laughs> it was really nice to have uh, to see Home Chef and Kroger and of course Home Chef they do uh, the preparatory meals uh, that they Instacart and you can go to Kroger and pick up salads and all of that so they were saying that I think they do a billion a year or something all over the world and a million so it was, yeah, those it was numbers, numbers were just <laughs> just phenomenal you know, 100,000 families a week I believe is what they said isn't so that all crazy the meals associated with that yep. yes sir so thank you so much that's all I have Mr. Mayor Pro Tem thank you Madam Mayor any other questions from council members 
Okay. Um, just to be clear, um, so we, we've already provided the abatement for the tenant. This is the abatement for the landlord. Correct. Essentially. So to Which enable is in them essence to a pass through to the tenant because mm -hmm. it's what they call a triple net lease. And so uh -huh. the tenant's required to pay the taxes. And so mm -hmm. it's a pass through, but because the landlord owns it, mm -hmm. they have to be a party to the agreement. Is it typical to have that arrangement after after they get the tenant? Or do, I'm so used to seeing abatements come for when before the building is built, norm, not normally after the building is built. It was it was actually when we started the project, the building was it was dirt, mm -hmm. <laughs> and so it's just kind of taking time to kind of get to this point, okay. um, and and really a lot of this time has been kind of working with the owner of the building and their lenders and legal team. Mm -hmm. It's a very convoluted process to folks because of how we have to do things in Georgia. So a lot of times it takes months on end to get lenders comfortable with this process. Okay. Yeah. That's all I have. Um, if there are no other questions, then I guess we will place this on the uh, agenda for Monday. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Mr. Pumphrey. Appreciate it. That's all we have under the Economic Development Committee at this time, Madam Mayor. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, um, Mr. Pumphreys. We appreciate the presentation. We'll move on then to Finance Committee and the Vice Chair is Council Member Chris Watts. Thank you, Madam Mayor. We have You're one welcome. item tonight. <clears throat> Authorize the Mayor to execute change order number seven with Ray Lynn and Associates, Inc. for the Douglasville Downtown Amphitheater Green Space Construction Project for Material Costs Escalation and Existing Stormline Replacement and other changes to the stormline infrastructure, unsuitable soil remediation, additional demolition, and rock blasting services. And I believe Mr. Thompson is going to handle this. Yes, sir. Good evening again, Madam Mayor, Council. Good evening. Um, Marcus Thompson, City Engineer, 6701 Church Street, Douglasville, Georgia. I just want to reiterate that the change order before you tonight is a combination of the material cost escalation, the stormwater pipe replacement along Church Street, um, suitable soil remediation, uh, additional de demolition services for the existing bridge structure, and an additional rock blasting near the placement of the proposed cistern that was recently installed, and um, other utility pathways. I do have Steve Marr with CPS, our program manager, here to explain these uh, changes a little bit better than I could um, for you tonight. So I'll defer to Steve Marl. Thank you. Uh, your name and address for the record, sir. Steve Morrow, 2005 Goldenrod Road, Roswell, Georgia. Okay. Mayor, Council, it was great to have you all out uh, for the topping out ceremony that we had just about a week ago. Um, and with the progress that you've seen on site, we've obviously run into some challenges that do need resolution, and that's really what um, we're going to discuss today. So uh, I think in front of you, you've got a copy of a short presentation that I put together that kind of walks through each one of these. Um, and quickly, I'll go through them, and if we've got questions or you've got questions as I'm going, please interrupt me. Uh, but first up um, was the uh, price escalation. Uh, so just briefly, as the bids were the bids went out, um, the contract was selected. Um, all of the bids that were inside the original proposals were good for 30 days. Award was not made until following much later than that 30 days. So the bids expired and the contractors were offered the opportunity because the market was so volatile and continues to be volatile on certain uh, aspects of construction. They had afforded the opportunity that if the pricing changed significantly for them to be able to come back and ask for uh, compensation to, to make sure that they were covered for the costs associated with the materials that were going to needed for the construction project. We have a mountain of data um, to be able to support each and every single one of the items that they've asked for, uh, down to the detail of what they were asking for for the price on bid day, um, the backup data that shows what their new prices were and how it was supported based on what the market conditions were providing. So for each item that's actually in there, you've got that backup data that we can either go through if it's needed uh, or if anybody needs to go into any item or wants to in any depth beyond what we're covering tonight. Um, so that covers uh, the first one. 
Um, second one, I, I did attempt to just draw a, or have a picture there to give you an idea, but right along Church Street, um, there was a storm line that um, I don't think was originally understood was there, and if it was there, we, uh, we believed it was to be much deeper and in working condition. Uh, once we cleared the site and started to clear the area, we found out that the storm line was actually very near su the surface, and once we cleared the dirt away, we found out that it was in complete disrepair. Um, so the only way for us to be able to go through and have that piece of storm line, which is required for us to be able to move the water through the site, uh, we worked closely with WSA. We looked at exactly what needed to be done. They came out and helped us to understand it. Uh, finally, it was determined, take out the entire storm line, get it down to the depth that we need it to link up with the existing storm systems or the new storm systems that we're installing and replace that section of storm line uh, along Church Street. And that's the red line there. It's a little, I know that's a small drawing, uh, but it, there's, a, there's a long stretch along Church Street there that connects into the new storm lines that we're, that we're installing. Um, the next one, um, a little bit more difficult to, to try to explain or, or show, but um, on the site, we originally had storm lines that were going to connect uh, and go through a certain area of the site. Um, on that drawing, you're going to see that um, yellow or the red circle that I've got there. That's the largest area on the site where we found a lot of the rock that we're going to talk to in the, in the next couple of uh, changes. But that area, that storm line was supposed to run through there. In order to avoid having to blast out or remove that rock, we had asked the designer, the civil engineer, to redesign the system so we could avoid that rock. Uh, and what they came up with was our ability to be able to eliminate that section of pipe and capture the water in a different way and avoid having to remove that rock from the site. And that's what this change order does, is it changes the work that needed to be done in order to reroute the water so we didn't have to deal with removing the rock from the site. Um, the next one has to do um, with soil remediation or unsuitable soils. So in construction, our ability to be able to place a structure which includes utility lines on soil, the soil needs to be able to support whatever it is um, that we're putting on top of it and the type of soil that we find in the ground um, and the compaction level that we can achieve to make sure that it can support whatever we're putting on top of it gets measured by folks in the field. Um, there's certain tests that are run. We have a special inspection firm that goes out there and verifies that the soil is at the capacity that we need to be able to put whatever it is that we're putting on it. Uh, and in this case, we found unsuitable soils in a couple of different locations that required us to not achieve the compaction that we needed. So that soil needed to be dug out to a certain depth and then it needed to be backfilled with what we call structural fill or a different kind of stone, whatever was determined by the special inspection firm to be able to sustain making sure that whatever we were putting on top of it um, would support what we needed. And these two areas, or this particular one talks about the removal of all of that soil uh, and then replacing it with the soil or the, the rock that we needed to to be able to support the storm lines uh, or um, the new water line that needed to go in along the along the back of the, the property. Removal of rock, so this is the rock blasting area. So I put a couple of pictures on there just to give you an idea of what we were going. What we have on the site next to the stage building is a very large water retention cistern. It's a big tank. So all of the water from the site, the rain leader water, all going in there for us to collect it to be able to reuse it as part of the sprinkler system it's just a it's a sustainability item that was built into the design for us to have this large cistern to be able to collect the water and reuse it um, well as large as that is I'd say the tank is probably I think it was it's 15 by 24 and I think it's at least 10 or 12 feet in height so think about the depth that it needs to go down and as we started to dig down we that's where we found the rock and the only way to remove the rock uh, is to actually drill, put explosives into it, break it up into chunks, and be able to get it out of the out of the hole so that we could put the cistern there. We looked at many alternatives other than having to remove the rock because that is the most timely and costly way to do it. Could we relocate the cistern? Could we do something else with it? Um, because of the size of it and the, and the site, the restrictions that we have, there was just no other way for us to be able to fit that item into the site to continue to have the sustainable feature of having the cistern without taking the rock out of the ground and then placing it in. And then as we place the rock in, we then have to create the new bottom or the new surface that the tank actually sits on, which is filled with rock. And that's what covers this entire aspect of that change order. Skip one. 
That's it. So that was that's that's the most significant portion of the, of the change order. Those are the most significant items that have come before us, and uh, you know, got, tried to go over them as quickly as I can to give you an idea of what they are. Um, but we continue to to work and try to press forward. You guys have seen the process or the mm -hmm. the product. The things are continuing to move, and we're getting up out of the ground. Solving these last couple of issues with getting these pipes in the ground resolved kind of yeah. gets us to cover everything up, and then start moving even faster at an upward rate and we're really working hard to try to get there but unfortunately we've got to deal with some of these issues that uh, that are in the ground any questions for me um, madam mayor do you have anything very quickly thank you so much it's good to see you again and thanks so much steve and um, our, our city Engineer, Mr. Thompson, and I know we've gone through this before, and of course it was uploaded for council to look at, and I just wanted you to, I know it's already done, but just to give them ease that you've spoken with WSA about all of these things, and of course a sister, and I was thinking, how come you just can't put it on top of the rock? you got to break up the rock. But anyway, all that, so thank you. And for, we did. Uh, the working relationship with WSA is great because we did run into another issue recently where okay. we passed to them. Uh, they've helped us come up with a solution and, and work together with it. So that has been a, a great working relationship with them to help us solve some of these underground issues that we've got out there on site. Yes, sir. And then the, the first uh, change order that you talked about with um, breaking up the rock and putting it in that back area, has that um, been remedied as far as, I mean, if we're talking with some, I don't know who so we're it, supposed it, to talk with, not, their not group? Yet. Or? We're waiting for the developer to just give us the final final answer on that's, that. That's right. We're, we're just waiting for a response. And okay. As soon as we do, then I'll be able to bring that one. That, that one's pending Oh, we haven't right talked now. about that one no, yet. No, that one's okay. pending for us to be able to do that one. Not, not, okay. Not I yet. thought I saw that in the, when you were no, talking what, about I think what, the what you saw there was the, the, the photo or the drawing that I had that had the blue area. That's Remember yes. when I, I came the first time, I talked about the new water line okay. that needed to go? Yes, well, The sir. soil that that water line needed to sit on. Was, it wasn't suitable in that area for the mm -hmm. soil that was there, so we had to remove it and replace it with good stuff for the for that water for line, that, and that's the area. Line. That's with that blue line, but it's in the same area okay. that you're talking about because at the bottom of that slope is where all of that rock, rock and other debris to is that we want to be able to determine what we're going to do with it. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank yes, you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, Mr. Thompson, so the, the total for this change orders, if I'm reading this right, is 918000 Yes, and I just want to point out too that uh, we do have a healthy contingency, and this is um, this fund, this cost that you see will be coming out of our contingency. So the contingency will cover this change order. Yes, sir. All right, thank you. Uh, any yes, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, on, on the PCO number twenty-seven, can I uh, can I assume that we did get a deduct on the line that's not being put in? Was that because I mean so sometimes it, that can be. Y yes, missed. sir. Um, and actually. Um, this particular one has subsequently changed yet again, so there's yet another deletion, okay. but for another modification that needed to be made because we got so far with this one, and then we ran into another issue with our ability to be able to collect the water and send it. So yes, the deletion, everything associated with the piece of pipe that didn't go on the ground was accounted for, okay. um, and this was only covering the part that did change, but then we only got so far, so in the next one, we've deleted out yet again to add in to be able to do the next civil engineer's change, uh, which is literally just getting finalized now. We're waiting for WSA to put their stamp on it so that I can finalize that one. I've seen contractors somehow forget that. No, I, every it once is, in a while. it's the first question or first <laughs> item I look for okay. is to make sure that those items are coming back that were not actually installed. The other thing on number 34 on the on the rock removal, how, how did that not get picked up on the geotechnical uh, borings? Is it just such a so small area? Great, great, another great question. So typically, in, in my experience, what we focus on when we're doing the soil borings or the soil analysis, typically within the foundations of the buildings that are either getting built or getting put on the site, you could do a grid pattern across the entire site. It's money that typically is not well spent because if you're not putting a structure of some kind there, then usually the soil analysis is not really that important. In this particular area, this sits off the side of the foundations of the building, so it was in an area that uh, probably was not particularly found. 
but I will also mention that the staff did put a contingency or a healthy contingency on this project knowing that this site did have some amount of rock that was going to be found that we were going to try to avoid to the best of our ability like we have with the storm line. But in some cases, it's right where we need to put something that there was no other option for us to deal with it. Well, frankly, I'm surprised we didn't find more rock. So there is quite a bit more, but it, fortunately, as we found that vein and continued where we've avoided using it, we know kind of really right where it is, and there is nothing else of any magnitude in the ground that needs to go there, so we're avoiding it at all costs. And are any other concerns of any other diggings that's going to have to happen that we need, don't know yet as far as where so rock we, could be? So we are at the end of digging. We've got a couple of these other issues, as I mentioned, that we're still kind of dealing with with these storm lines just to get them finished, um, but I've told everybody... I am working as hard as I can to get us out of the ground, and as soon as we resolve these remaining issues and we're out, then I don't want to have to talk about soil, dirt, or rock for a long time. <laughs> Nor do we. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That's all. Yes. Yes, sir. Any other questions from Council? Yes. Madam Mayor. Okay, I'm not repeating. Like I told the citizens, they can't keep coming back. This is not a question, just a, a, <laughs> a I don't want to keep coming back to this year, <laughs> I Mayor. know. <laughs> but if council wants to um, just see something that Steve is, has to overcome and recently been successful with, with coming out of the ground with rocks and stone and dirt and all that, it's at Kennesaw State. They just finished the new uh, dorms across the, from my daughter's old. She was like, How can, I can't move into new dorms. But they're really, really nice. I mean, it looks a, it's a beautiful project. And I know in Kennesaw, this Kennesaw Mountain, it's a lot of stone, rock, dirt, all of that you all had so I, issues I, with. But it's a beautiful um, finished product. But great example. So not a State cistern, University. we had underground water retention in the, on that project that was 30 plus feet below. Wow. And we ran into rock and had to do the very exact same thing. We had to drill it out, blast it, and get it out of the site so that we could get our water retention underground where it needed to be. Oh, very good. I didn't know you had all those issues, but I know it's difficult topography it at uh, Kennesaw State. is very hilly there. So yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yes, Vice Chair. Any other questions from Council? All right. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, we've got a quorum tonight, but I was wondering about putting this on the consent agenda. Is that all right with you all? Yeah. All right, thank good. you. Thank you for y'all's presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, you Council. You're welcome. Madam Mayor, that's all I had tonight under finance. Thank you so much, Mr. Vice Chair. I appreciate you taking that committee for me. Housing and Community Affairs Committee, I'll ask uh, Councilman Estes, who's one of the members, to take that committee, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. No business under Housing and Community Affairs tonight. Thank you, sir. Legislative and Intergovernmental Committee, chaired by Councilmember Samuel Davis. No bitch that this time, Madam Mayor. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Councilman Davis. Personnel and Organization Committee, chaired by Councilmember Chris Watts. Thank you, Madam Mayor. We have no business tonight under Personnel and Organization. Thank you so much, Coach. We'll move on then to Planning and Development Committee, and I'll ask the Mayor Pro Tim, who's one of the committee members, to please take this committee for me. Thank you, Madam Mayor. You're welcome. Uh, we have a couple of things under <laughs> Planning and Development tonight. Yes, sir. Uh, the first item is to hold a public hearing and consider a request for a change in zoning from PUD, which is a planned unit development district, mm -hmm. to LI, a light industrial district, for approximately 95.11 acres located on Riverside Parkway and Land Lot 169, District 1, Section 5, Parcel 4, Parcel ID number 0169015004. Mm -hmm. The application is by Edge Connex Real Estate Acquisitions, LLC, care of Edmund Wilson, and Ms. Shayla Reed will provide a presentation. Thank you. Okay. Good evening, Mayor Good evening. and Council. I'm Shayla Reed. I'm the Community Development Director for the City, located at 96, or I think it's what I'm saying around 6 or 7, 10. Across the street. Across the street. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Still getting used to the address. Um, this is a rezoning for Riverside Parkway. Um, as um, you may know, it is as Edge Connects as mentioned. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. So the um, applicant is asking for a data center on Riverside Parkway. Um, the property is currently zoned PUD with a focus on PRD, which is the base zoning. There's currently 95.11 acres on this parcel, and they're requesting to have it completely zoned as industrial. As you're seeing here, the property is zoned PUD, um, plan unit development. The surrounding parcels are zoned PUD as well, um, or PSP, which is what the governmental zonings would be for any type of use that government would like to have, particularly um, ourselves or the county would have. Um, according to the DCD plan for tributary, it has identified the preferred uses to be R6T, 
R3, R2, um, neighborhood commercial or office and institutional. Um, it does not have industrial as a preferred use for the DCD. Um, however, in your comprehensive plan, your comprehensive comprehensive plan has identified that the mixed-use design um, has for a DCD, general commercial, R2, office and institutional, R3, R4, R6, light industrial, R6T, neighborhood commercial, or heavy industrial for, um, I guess, recommended rezoning um, land uses. Mm -hmm. This is the location, as you can see it from Riverside, how it currently looks today. This is the proposed site plan. I want to be a little bit more informative here. You're seeing the actual proposed building at um, close to about 400,000 square feet. There is a traffic study needed for it because it's under the required 500 square feet. Currently, as mentioned, the parcel that's being requested is 95.11. However, you do have an item on today's agenda that's asking to subdivide though that parcel of 95.11 to 52 and 42. So you'll see that coming up very soon. With that, staff recommended the following condition um, in addition to recommendations that the applicant has. Staff is asking for a recommendation that if this was to be approved as a data, data center, staff is asking for there to only be one data center allowed on the site. If I can go back to explaining to you that they're asking to subdivide, you would have to ask what does that mean for your subdividing later? Um, because you have 9511 that you're dealing with now, you're 95 acres now, and if mm -hmm. you place that condition on there, you will have to decide how that condition falls for the split when that parcel comes up. The applicant is asking for additional conditions. They have been meeting with the property owners. They have asked for a number of conditions, just to name a few. They're asking for a future cell tower. They're asking for there to be um, an opportunity for an interest to be on Roberts Road versus on Riverside. Um, they're asking for an electric substation to be located on the site. They're also asking for there to be um, a, a consistent entrance on Riverside, as we mentioned before, and then the full cost of installation for substation charging stations. And then lastly, of course, a funded trail for parking. Um, lastly, the Planning Commission at their November 1st meeting recommended denial of this application. That concludes my report. All right. So I guess the developer has a representative here to complete the presentation. Good evening, everyone. Joe Fowler, Post Office Box 489 in Douglasville. Pleased to be able to introduce Cindy Shattuck, a representative of Edge Connects. That is an international data center provider, which is the applicant and what you have before you. The company is actually headquartered in Northern Virginia, but with other locations in Singapore and Amsterdam. They have 50 data centers in 20 countries. And she will explain those data centers are across Europe, Asia, North and South America. When you dig deeply into what they're doing, they're actually an innovator in what's called next generation data center operating systems. And it's also recently launched a program known as Volterra. And that's an undertaking in which it's addressing, and I'm quoting now, the siting, acquiring, powering, building and operating of strategically located, fit for purpose, charging facilities. I'll talk about that more in just a second. As Shayla noted, the project is to be located on the 95 acre site within Tributary. Just a little bit of background. The request was originally submitted on June the 29th, and it was a request as now for light industrial, but not general light industrial. It was always understood, and in fact, the application stated it was only for a data center. But then shortly before we had the meeting at which that was to be considered, we met with the neighbors in tributary at the city's municipal building, and the neighbors expressed general concern that 
Even if the city council conditioned the rezoning to light industrial for a data center, it might be, for example, that Edge Connects might relocate elsewhere. And then what would happen is you'd have a property that's its own light industrial and tributary in the city had fought and won a proposal that would have placed a light industrial building for warehouse purposes there. So the way we came from that came away from that meeting was that anything light industrial just seemed not warranted because of the attendant truck traffic. And it was suggested by some at the meeting that night that we see if we could shift it to O and I. And because the data center has no truck traffic, and as Cindy will explain, very few employees, maybe 30 at the most, that seemed like an appropriate thing to be done if it could be approved by the city. So we talked to the staff, and at least preliminarily, it looked like O and I would be workable. So having spoken with the staff, we changed the application to O and I, consistent with what had been requested at that meeting by the residents of Tributary. However, it was later determined, right before the meeting at which the O and I was to be considered, that you couldn't do it after all because of something that deals with the NAICS code requirements. And because of that, we refiled to light industrial, but again, conditioned only for the data center use. Not for one data center, but for the entire 95 acres. I'll explain more about that in just a second. Since making our application, we've had a host of meetings with representatives of the tributary subdivision, many of whom I both recognize and see here tonight. And they begin to express concern that they actually didn't want a data center there at all, notwithstanding the fact that it would be conditioned to light industrial only for the data center. And that what would go with that would be the elimination of truck traffic only car employee, employees for, I'm sorry, cars for the employees that would be working there. There'd be traffic, obviously, when they build the building, but there would be no other traffic. The general view we heard from Tributary most recently is they don't want anything but residential there. And when you see the existing ordinance, it would be permitted for a host of residential uses. However, we think there are good reasons to do this as a data center based on the application that you have before you. First, as I just mentioned, there's a traffic study before you that I hope you have a chance to review between now and Monday that points out this is a very light traffic use. As I just said, essentially no truck traffic at all, especially after construction is completed, with only that small amount of employees that I noted. Secondly, your comp plan is perfectly consistent with this use. There's industrial in the area, as you know, across the street, and you can see it before you with McMaster Car, Kihi, up and down Riverside Parkway. This is a significant movement away from generic light industrial. I know those two letters are like a four-letter word to everybody, and I, I can understand that, but this is an $800 million investment with essentially no traffic, no school children, no impact on utilities, law enforcement, and so forth. It is, with all due respect to our brothers and sisters in tributary, this is an extraordinarily good use for the city. Now, we listened when we met with the folks at tributary and tried to pay careful attention to what their concerns were. We could never reach any by cell phones out there because the cell phone traffic out there is terrible. The interruption is awful. If you've ever lived there or been there for meetings, we have an office there, used it consistently for years on end. You just don't have good cell phone service. And so we said as condition number one that we provided before the Planning and Zoning Board, and you've seen just a summary of those that Shayla pointed about earlier, but specifically and more extensively, the property shall be used for the development of data centers and Edge Connects will lease or grant an easement over the property to a cell tower company for the construction of a cell tower. We don't build and operate cell towers. If they have data needs, we may take care of those. But we don't build and operate cell towers. We have not at this point contacted a company to say, 
can a cell tower be on this 52-acre tract that we are acquiring, but we will donate the land to any entity that can put a cell tower there at no cost. Now, sometimes those, you may know this, sometimes those cell towers are on leased property. If they don't want to buy it but want to lease it, Edge Connects will do that. When we met Monday night to talk about this in a conference call, there was concern that we were not being sufficiently specific with respect to not just this, but the rest of the conditions that I'll mention in just a moment. Let me just say this for those who may be concerned about what I'm about to say and what will be in writing if this is granted. All of these conditions must be completed before a certificate of occupancy can be granted. So if Cindy comes in with her folks and say, hey, we've finished everything, and when any one of these things has not been completed, there will not be a certificate of occupancy. The lever that the citizens can stand on is that the city of Douglasville is going to enforce this because it's the condition of zoning. Number two, a Georgia power substation has to be located on the site in order to bring the power to this location. We have agreed that the substation will be screened from Riverside Parkway by one of two means. And that's just up to the city at the development plan approval stage, either by enhanced landscaping so that you can't see it, or by the construction of a wall to serve as a physical screening, if requested, by the city of Douglasville. If you see the map before you, you'll notice there's a jut out section of the right of way, right in that area, and you'll see it, see it more in just a moment. There is a berm that rises to 30 feet above the base elevation of Riverside Parkway, which is at the 850 MSL elevation. It goes to 880. There will be screening in that area, and if the city requests at the development plan approval stage that there be a wall, it will be on the edge connects side of where all those trees are located. And if the city says, let's do enhanced landscaping, Edge Connects is fine with that condition. Next, you'll see Roberts Road on that overhead. The entrance to the data center will be on Roberts Road and not on Riverside Parkway. That's where the location will be. It will be wherever the city at the development plan approval stage says it needs to be, but we agree that it can be on River, on Roberts Road, not Riverside Parkway. We'll do that as a condition of the zoning enforceable by the CO. Next, we will also provide enhanced landscaping at the intersection of Roberts Road and Riverside Parkway, sort of like what you see there at American Red Cross, and we will do it in conjunction with the project that has already been approved by the city across the street by the East Group Company. We will coordinate the design of course, that would be as a part of the development plan approval. Next, drilling down on a couple of things that apply locally at Tributary, Edge Connects will pay the full cost to install two dual level two EV charging stations in the Tributary Village and in the Riverbanks neighborhood at locations to be determined by the Tributary HOA. So they tell us where it should be, Edge Connects will pay for it, and furthermore, they will donate $5,000 as a fund for the future maintenance of those charging stations. That was not in what I initially provided to Shayla. That's something that we came up with after our discussions Monday night. And then finally, there have been a lot of discussions about the property owner donating a sum of money to help with the trail system in that area, and we had proposed a revision to what you saw earlier about the trails, and that is tributary land partners will contribute the sum of $50,000 to the state of Georgia Department of Natural Resources to be directed for use for the Sweetwater Park State Park for public parking and trail improvements, and those will be made on or before, or that donation would be made on or before March the 31st, 2023. We discussed these with a number of tributary HOA members. We've modified them since that discussion, and we hope that allays some of their concerns. Now, with your permission, Mr. Chairman, Madam Mayor, Cindy has a presentation with respect to how all this looks like on the ground. Thank you.
Good evening, Mayor Good and evening. Council Members. I'm Cindy Shattuck, uh, 2801 South Ogden Street in Inglewood, Colorado. I am a representative of EdgeConnex. I'm a property uh, site development manager. Um, so, give you a brief overview of our company. Um, we were founded in 2009. Um, we built our first data center in, uh, in operational in 2013. In the ensuing nine years, we have built over uh, 50 data centers in more than 20 countries. So we are pretty quick on our feet. Um, our customers are all large players in the digital universe, and they trust us. They know that we can provide um, a quality data center with thin uh, budget and on time. Um, our sites typically range from about 15,000 square feet to about uh, 366,000 square feet. Uh, we started off by using um, old <coughs> warehouses that we renovated, and we have kind of moved on to building uh, larger data centers uh, from scratch on, um, on land. Um, we are innovators in our industry. We have a data, data center infrastructure management system that we have built from scratch and that uh, allows our customers to see into the data center from anywhere in the world. They can uh, monitor their servers. They can do certain things with them. Um, we have very high security with our data centers. Um, and over 80% of our customers are investment grade customers. Um, we have long-term contracts that are from anywhere from 15 to 20 years typically at our data centers. Um, in 2020, we were purchased by an investment group, a uh, private investment group called EQT. Um, they have a global base and they have indicated certain um, cities that we are likely to be building speculatively in. And Atlanta is one of the uh, areas that was mentioned as a high growth opportunity. And this is why we're here today, um, because we are looking to uh, build additional data centers. As you'll see as we go through some of these slides, we already have data centers in Atlanta. So these are uh, the yellow dots on the map here are um, some of the places that we currently have data centers in. We started out in the United States. We've expanded into um, Europe, uh, Asia, South America. These are locations in the United States. Here's an example of the types of buildings that we um, have built in the past. Um, as you can see in the upper left-hand corner, we do have two data centers in uh, Atlanta proper, right on the Beltline. Um, and then this just kind of gives you a view of what our data centers have looked like. The two data centers that we have currently are on Donnelly Avenue on the West End. Uh, we started off with a 30,000 square foot building um, in two, 2015, and both of these existing buildings that we renovated. Uh, the second building is 100,000 square feet just down the road from our first one. Um, built in 2019, and we're here to talk about the third one. Uh, these are the same photos that were in the previous one. This is our um, Atlanta 02 building, right along the belt line. So for this project, we are uh, expecting to spend about $400 million. Um, this will be built out in two phases, so 400000 for the first phase. 800,000 uh, total. The building's footprint will be about 350,000 square feet on that one parcel of 53 acres. Class A design and construction. Um, the building, which I'll get to in just a second, it's uh, built in an H configuration and the middle part will be a uh, office and storage area. Joe's already talked about the uh, entrance off of Roberts Road. Um, Georgia Power, we've been in constant conversations with them about um, what our requirements would be and how to best do that. They would like to build a substation on the, the property there on the um, northern end. All elements um, would be screened, the trash, the um, 
any of the mechanical um, elements that we have. Uh, I've discussed our infrastructure management system that allows for remote management. Um, we did start our company by building something that could be completely remotely managed. So if there are hurricanes or any inclement weather, we can still function without actual people being there for a certain amount of time. And we are also a founding member of a, an organization called Infrastructure Masons, which helps um, bring new talent into um, the digital industries. And we have, um, we have many different initiatives going with that. So um, there's a link there if you'd like to learn more about that. This is a rendering of uh, what we intend to build. Here's the uh, H style structure that you've seen. Um, so Riverside Parkway is up on the right hand side there. And this does not show the substation, but that would be between um, the building and Riverside. And here's a site plan, which you saw previously in uh, uh, the prior presentation. Um, Um, so the substation there is shown on the left. We would be building, as I said, in two phases. We would build uh, one half of the structure probably on the lower end first, and then we would build uh, the second phase as, um, as need dictates. The area up there where it says edge connects on the far right-hand side, that is the area that we would propose putting a cell tower in. But again, that would be determined by any provider that would want to come in and put one up. Okay, I'm gonna hand this over to Mike Lash, who is our uh, representative from CBRE. Good evening, Council Mayor. Thank you so much for having me here. Uh, it's been a pleasure representing Edge Connects uh, in this endeavor. Uh, we started um, almost 12 months ago, mm -hmm. and Elevate Douglas did a very good job of identifying this property for us back then. Mm -hmm. uh, they did explain the history with the projects that were there before, uh, as far as the industrial use that was wanting to go there and how that would cause a lot of traffic. And so uh, we were delighted to bring a data center use to the area that would hopefully be conducive with what the community is trying to accomplish. Uh, for this spot. This is a quick slide showing you what the rationale is to support the rezoning. As it's already been mentioned by Joe and Cindy, this is a massive capital investment for the community. $400 million for the first initial phase, $800 million for the full 95 acres. Uh, the low impact on the schools, fire, safety, and of course the, the uh, roads, uh, it can't be understated. These things really do pay for themselves. Uh, there are quite a bit of construction jobs that do come with the builds, and even though there's not many full-time jobs afterwards, they're very high-paying jobs. Uh, and then if you look at some of the stats on your own mission statement and what you're trying to accomplish for your community, it really sits dead center in the professional technology services uh, that you see. Elevate Douglas does have the, this on their website as well, showing that data centers are a great use for the community and we're again we want to stay within the guidelines of what they're wanting to see here uh, for uh, for their market to give you an idea of what one of the other things that elevate Douglas pointed out was the surrounding uses in the area and what those are today you have American Red Cross you have make which has a blood manufacturing plant uh, right next near near the property you have McMaster car which is a e-commerce distribution center you have Kihi Solutions, which is also a type of distribution center. And then you have East Group, who is proposing two spec-built industrial buildings uh, right across the street from, from Roberts Road. As you can see, these are all the neighbors that Edge Connects would have, uh, along with the sewer plant down in the, the lower left. Here's the traffic study that does show some scenarios. The first scenario, it's the maximum build for the 95 acres, right? So you can fit maximum to code, not this, that this would actually ever happen, but it would be 570 multifamily units 
our proposed use for the full 95 acres, not just for the first phase, would create 722 daily trips. And that's a pretty liberal number. It's probably going to be a lot less than that. And then if you look at the delta, it's a significant difference of over 3,000 <coughs> daily trips. Now, if you look at a more realistic idea of what can go there, very similar to some of the community apartments that are coming up around the area, and put a three in the middle, there's a 300 multifamily unit um, daily trips of almost 2,000 trips. With our proposed use, full max build out of the 95 acres, you're still looking at 722. That's a difference of around thir almost 1,300 um, trips. And then just to kind of give you an idea, there are significant apartment complexes that are coming up around the area within a one to two mile radius, which will add quite a bit of daily trips of around 8,000 total trips with all those projects. This can't be stressed enough, the, what Joe was alluding to, the, the look and feel of this building. We want it to be almost imagine a nice high grade uh, healthcare facility. It's, it's, it's going to be very beautiful for the things that you can even see from the street. It'll, there's a huge buffer that allows it to be off of, off of Riverside and away from the community. Um, very great architectural design. Edge Connects does a phenomenal job of building and have great product versus some of the other uh, uses that are out there. Um, here's another shot of basically what those viewpoints look like from Riverside Road. And again, between what Joe was mentioning about uh, the, the berms being protected, making sure that the setbacks are there, along with the tree buffers that are going to stay in place, along with any screening that is requested and, and required by the city. Um, our hope is to keep the, the natural aesthetic of what is there today. And then, as you can see as well, where East Group is planning on building their two industrial sites right next door to us. The natural berm, the buffers, once again, the goal is to keep everything to where when you're driving down there, it keeps the natural aesthetic of what it looks like today. A few more examples of what these screens could possibly look like, depending on what's approved by your development team. And then just to really drive it home here, the reason why the Edge Connects has done everything it could to work with the community on the stipulations. Uh, the, the property will be solely used for data centers. There is no industrial that could be used for this rezoning before or after it's a data center. Uh, Edge Connects will grant an easement for a cell phone tower to bring some service into the area. Um, they will help Georgia Power create a screening for, this, for the substation. Uh, the entrance will be on Roberts Road instead of Riverside Road. Uh, they will, Edge Connects will put two EV stations and work with the HOA to find out where those should be located and not only put the bill for those EV stations, but also help with the maintenance of those, subs of those EV stations moving forward for electric vehicles. Um, and then tributary land partners, the current landlord will donate or contribute rather $50,000 to a state, the state of Georgia Department of Natural Resources to help with the state park and any type of use that is, was, is approved by the HOA in that area. We thank you so much for your time, and um, if you have any questions, happy to take those now. Thank you for the presentation. Um, before we open up the public hearing, I turn to the m mayor and council see if they have any questions or comments. Excuse me, Mr. Time. Chairman. May I make one more point? I failed uh, to mention. All right. Take less than a minute. There's a right of first refusal for the remaining acreage of this 95-acre parcel. So Edge Connects is acquiring portion that you saw with the building. It has a right of first refusal for future expansion. I know there's a recommendation for staff for one data center only. The rationale for our opposing that respectfully is that Edge Connects might in the future acquire that other tract. If it does not, it would be another company, but it would only be a data center. Thank you. Yeah. Excuse me. Yeah, and just to add on to that, a lot of the a lot of the cost to bring a data center with the substation and so on and so forth. A lot of those are, are built out for the full 95 acres, even though we're starting with just the first 53 acres. You're talking about the other half of that? It's sort of a slightly slightly divided piece of property. You're talking about the other? The other the Correct. Other the other 43 acres that's closer to the sewer plant. You don't plant. own that right now. I'm sorry? You, don't, you say you don't own that right now. C correct. Yeah. We, okay. we're, we're, but the, it's very important for data centers to have opportunities to grow in the future. And again, 
the the amount of cost it, it costs to bring in the substation from Georgia Power and a few of these other utilities, it's really it's based on a, a plan for the entire 95 acres to be data center. All right. Madam Mayor, do you have any questions or comments? I do. Um, thank you so much. I appreciate it, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you uh, for the presentation. I do have a question, and it is just directed at probably our legal or city manager. Um, Attorney Fowler mentioned something about it, NAICS, which initially, of course, it's R6, and it's in the PUD, and we went to Light Industrial, then O&I. What were those code requirements? What does, Mr. Reed, you may be answer as well, NAICS, what is that acronym mean and why uh, was it considered that that was at one time a viable option and then changed that it was not? Okay, so um, we, we kind of nicknamed that code to be NAICS. Um, NAICS is a National Association of International Codes. Okay. What that is is where when there's a business license given to a property, we use that code to assist us in translating the use in the zoning code to the business license. Okay. And so with that, um, when staff is receiving a request from an applicant mm -hmm. for a business, your zoning code tells me to go to that particular NAICS code to, fit, to find out the definition. Mm -hmm. So the original request was a NAICS code that was not more so a data center. It was more so of a design software. Okay. Um, that's the one that was um, being requested um, on the second term that he was mentioning. But when the staff report came about and the re research that was necessary to do a staff report, it was found that that was not the proper NAICS code. The applicant was informed, and so they withdrew that application and came about to go back to light industrial where your um, traditional data centers are um, defined. Okay, so June 29th when the initial request was done, it was for a design software. For the first one, it was light industrial for the correct one, and then they withdrew that after speaking with the residents, and then uh -huh. they went into having the second NAICS code, which was more so for design software. Staff reviewed that application and found that that was not the proper NAICS code. They withdrew okay. that application and came back to light industrial. Because it's a PUD with an overlay, really, of residential. Residential R6, R6, T, R4, yes, so the site, R... Yes, ma'am, the site has an R6. Um, that is more so apartments mm -hmm. for that particular location. Mm -hmm. So that's what's currently zoned there for now. Okay. Um, and then I had another question about the tower, and this is probably directed to Attorney Fowler. You mentioned something about um, the feasibility or possibility for um, a tower to be leased, a cell tower on the 52 acres. And so you are saying that would just be, it would be donated land if someone were to come and want to build um, a cell tower to help with communications and more right. accessibility. Definitely need a cell tower in that area. Mm -hmm. And if it's determined based on the considerations that come into play when you locate a cell tower, if mm -hmm. it's determined that it can be on that property, it can go on that property. It's available if the industry says you can do that. Yes, sir. Many people know a lot more than I do, but I've done tons of zonings about these, and you can't just put one wherever you want to. Mm -hmm. There are considerations that have to be taken into consideration. And if it works here, the site is available in the location that she pointed out a moment ago. Yes, sir. Now, city manager, do we, I know we're in the middle of SDS, so we have to tip lightly, like really walking on water with the county, but is there a cell tower that's slated to go in that area for E-911 or firefighter, fire department? You may be referring to radios. I'm referring to radios. Never we're mind. We're covered on this radios. This is to get on the cell, on the cell phone. Yes, ma'am. We're, we're okay. covered on radios. Okay. I've, I have SDS going on in my brain, so mm -hmm. service delivery agreement, so I apologize. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I'll start to my right uh, with the wards representative, Councilman Estes. Do you have any questions or comments? I will reserve comment until I hear from the citizens. Fair enough. Councilman Davis. I will reserve rights until I hear from the citizen. I've looked at the emails that I had got. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Watts, any questions or comments? Um, I'll just one right now, uh, and this is more for Ms. Reed, uh, under um, standards of approval for rezoning and map amendments, number 10, the subject property not suitable for the proposed development that is outlined in the city's DCD 
plan or similar surrounding uses. Staff does not find the pr proposed industrial zoning classification to be suitable for the immediate area. Can you kind of elaborate on that? Yes, sir. So your DCD that was adopted by council as a um, direct plan, particularly for this area, outlined there to be a residential or commercial or office use for this area. It did not identify there to be industrial. So what happens with staff, when um, we are at the desk and we've received a request, we go into the adopted documents to identify what recommendations or what direction to go into, whether we give a recommendation to you or to the planning commission. So that adopted DCD that you're referencing did not include industrial as a use. So that statement was referencing the code um, that was adopted. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, I have one question for our city attorneys, and that is do both of you feel comfortable with the stipulations that Mr. Fowler had listed that they are all enforceable uh, if this were to be approved? Thank you, Mr. Dotson. Um, at this time, we are required to hold a public hearing on this uh, application, so um, I will not repeat the rules that the mayor had laid out at the beginning, but we do have a timer over there that uh, we'll keep track of each person as they come up and, and express their interest or concerns. Um, we will start with those who are, who are in favor, who would like to speak in favor of this uh, particular development. If they would come, state your name and address for the record, and proceed from there. Do not all rush up at once. I'll give it a moment, just in case somebody's slow to get up. Okay. Then we'll close that portion of the hearing and we'll open up the, the portion of the public hearing for those who would like to speak against this proposal. Um, please come one at a time. Give you. Uh, Present the assistant city clerk with your card that you would have filled out outside of the outside of the council chambers, and please come up to the podium, present your name and address for the record, and state your case. Mr. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem, as as our first citizen comes forward, uh, so what's the timeline on this again? Uh, how long do uh, folks that are going to speak against it's it have? We have total a total of twenty minutes, 20 minutes. Um, five minutes per speaker. And split their time up as long as it's 20 minutes in, in total. Thank you, Madam Mayor. My name is Aaliyah Roberts, and I live at 3219 Blackley Old Road, Douglasville, Georgia, 30135, in the tributary community. Um, with all due respect, Madam Mayor and ladies and gentlemen of the council, I find it disheartening that we find ourselves back in this situation advocating yet again that the parcel in question remain zoned as... Um, as residential and not be permitted to be rezoned light industrial. I have a few points I want to highlight before I yield my time to my fellow residents. The current landowners purchased the property, property in question after the summary judgment by Superior Court Judge, um, the Honorable Judge David Emerson. They knew this when they bought the property, the history that came along with it, and the community's fight to ensuring that it stayed, remained zoned residential, and they purchased the property anyways. Um, and, you know, they watch the, the community rally together to keep this parcel zoned residential. In the staff report included in your packet, data centers ultimately, um, you know, requires light industrial zoning and is not consistent with the original intent of the DCD. There is no hardship to the property owner. They can still make a profit on this property as zoned. The problem is that they want, they expect to make a fortune on the backs of the great citizens of Douglas County, and more specifically, those of us who live in the immediate vicinity, while providing no tangible return or value back to the community. I'm sorry, <laughs> to uh, elect EV chargers is just not quite consistent with a a light industrial use of something that could rather be 200 homes that would be added to my community and 200 additional families that would be added to my community and to people that I could get to know and to grow and develop as part of the great city of Douglasville. The property is not suited for the proposed development, and that's a direct quote from the staff report. An industrial zoning classification is not suitable for the immediate area. 
In general, I work in risk management as a profession, and this rezoning is too risky given that it opens the door to other light industrial uses should this conditional deal with the data center fall through. Well, yes, we can put stipulations on the zoning, but it still makes me, as a resident in the vicinity, uncomfortable with a rezoning to light industrial. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to come down and speak at this time? Madam Mayor, my name is Fielder Roberts. Um, I'm her husband. So live at 3219 Blackley Old Road, Douglasville, Georgia. Um, so I'm the treasurer for the tributary HOA. We have, have had several meetings with the developer, as they did mention. However, a couple points of contention here. We did not meet on Monday. We met on Tuesday night. The phone call for us to actually have a time frame to meet came in after hours on Friday, November 11th leaving the community less than four business days to actually get questions, talk to our constituents in the community to then get to a meeting. So every meeting we've had with the developer has been rushed. It's been their timetable. It has not been, well, let's find a day and time. Let's get people in there. Also, during the meeting, half the things they discussed today of here's new benefits, here's what we're offering, they were never discussed. We never got past item number three on the six they've presented to you guys here today. So having said that and also talked to our neighbors, this is not something that the neighborhood can wholly like support. We're vehemently opposed about it. This is not something that's going to add value to our community or add value to our neighborhood at all. Past that, has anybody been to Highway 5 to that Home Depot store? If you have, that store is 102,000 square feet. The building they're talking about is almost four of those buildings right there. And that's just part of it. So that's a large parcel that's being taken up by a data center on that property. And then if they expand, they're going to have another one just as big right there. And I get the argument that there's Kihi across the road. There's McMaster car across the road. There's the East Group going in. Guess what? We didn't oppose those because that was already zoned for those intended purposes. Granted, Kihi and McMastercar are supposed to be a golf course, but those are approved uses in a golf course, apparently. But the East Group was already supposed to be a mixed you know, office or that type of industrial development right there. It's part of that office park. We didn't oppose it. We were here for months and months opposing IDI. As soon as East Group came to you guys, we weren't here. We didn't oppose it because it was a valid use. It was already approved. This rezoning, we do not approve. So I oppose this, but also everyone my neighbors oppose it that I've spoken with. And there's 760 homes in our community. You put this in there, you're cutting off about 350 of them at the other end of Riverside. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Would anyone else like to come down and speak at this time? Hello, My name is Alicia Hayens. I'm also a resident of Tributary at 1709 Bankwell Closeway. I am opposing the project because there are several open end questions regarding the project, such as the second portion of the land and its usage. As a business owner and resident of Douglas County, I'm asking that the land is pre preserved for potential residential single family homes as Douglas County continues to grow. Several of my neighbors boast about the area and it being a prime location to live as it is easy access to commute throughout the county. I am asking the developers to consider other already welcome light industrial spaces as there is already a 1 million square foot data center located off of Thornton Road just a few minutes away from the proposed area in which has also taken away from potential, um, potential families moving into the Douglas County area. Thank you. Thank you. Back 
here again. Um, getting a little tired of the same bit of business. Um, so Na name and, and address. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Conrad Kiffin, 3214 Ancoats Street in Douglasville, Georgia, 30135. Um, moved to tri tributary about three years ago, and I've been coming to these since day one. And it seems pretty clear to me that nobody wants this. Nobody that lives there wants this. Uh, obviously, the, the folks behind us who are bringing the plan forward, they want it. Um, they brought five people today. But we have over 700 people that most likely don't want it. Um, we're not obstructionists. We want to see that land developed. We want to see that land developed for something that actually serves us, that serves Douglasville in a, in a more positive fashion. Um, the data centers that they mentioned were smaller, um, the, ones that, the ones that were in Atlanta, um, and the ones that were worldwide were just completely different projects. This is something that they've never really done before um, in this area or anything like this area. Um, industry is creeping in in our, in our sector, and we need more residential, more retail. Um, one of the things that was told to us was that to fulfill the, the dream, uh, the, pro the, the, the look of the Riverside Parkway, uh, we would need more rooftops. Well, now we have more rooftops. Um, and those rooftops all need good supermarkets, good retail, um, things to do. This is a place where we work, play, and live. And we have not been able to do that with projects like these that keep coming forward. Um, let's see what else I got here. <laughs> they talk about the tax value, uh, the, the, the added incentive to Douglasville. Uh, you can get that, you can still get that by doing residential projects, by doing retail projects. You don't have to just look at this one thing. Um, I have a bunch of other notes, but I'm going to yield the rest of my time back to my neighbors. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, we have about 10 minutes left. Okay. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Mayor. Good Council evening. Members. It's always a pleasure. Let me start, in fact, um, going back in history. Name and address Thank for you. Record, please. Oh, I'm sorry, Devin Abel. <laughs> I'm making comments. Devin Abel um, of 9930 Mancunian Way in Tributary, Douglasville 30135. Um, but thank you for keeping the warehouses away from us. Y'all helped us do that. We were here many, many times. We were in front of your planning commission. Um, and y'all whacked us. And you went all the way to the state Supreme Court. And you won. And we won. And we are grateful for that. So I just wanted to have that recognized. Um, also, as a point of civility, we do want to say that Edge Connects has been a better partner, a better partner. Still not everything we would want, as Fielder um, explained. Certain things have come up at the last moment. Things have gotten, there's been a little sense of bait and switch. Are they going to build one data center on the 50 acres and then another one later on the 40 and this and that and those and then now we're going to divide it, but what if both sides of the division are light industrial. So really all I want to say this particular evening, I want to say a couple things that I've said in front of the Planning Commission so that I have the opportunity to say them to you. Um, one is please think as long-term leaders about that vision for what you want it to be when people are driving from the airport and they come off Thornton and they come on Riverside. Um, right now, you know, yes, they do, they hit riverbanks and then they go through certain industrial pieces. But now it's starting to turn into something else as they come towards Fairburn Road. And we want to really, really vision something that's beautiful and useful and makes everyone want to move to that community, to our community. Um, the economy has shifted over the years. Many of us have only moved here in the last three to five years. And we were signing up for the dream of the comprehensive plan. I have here the future land use map that mixed use design. I just said to Chris Pumphrey, is it so much to ask that we want, want a little tiny Atlantic station over there? 
can we have that? <laughs> and then just one last point that again, the owner under the property owner understood what he was buying when he bought it. I believe that it was it was at a time that you could get land, it was cheap with the sense that we just rezoned like nothing at all. Let me just slide a few pages up so that I can quote something exactly and then I'll yield the rest of my time. I need to get to page 36. I just find it personally offensive and histrionic, the tone of the constitutional requirements that the owner talks about. Um, he had the right to buy the land under the zoning. He says that to deny this rezoning constitutes an abuse of police power. In such denial, there's been no substantial relation to health, general, general welfare. That to deny this rezoning that is some sort of God-given right would constitute a deprivation of property rights without the due process of law. And I think it's ridiculous. And we're tired of it. We ask you to stand for the vision of a beautiful future in Douglasville and to zone the land accordingly for the long term. Thank you very much. Thank you. Who would like to go next? The amount of time we have left now? We have about six minutes left. OK, thank you. Good evening. Um, I'll be like five seconds. Um, I'm here to show added presence to the Tripasera community. I'm also a part of the Neiman. HOA. Oh, Camilla Henry. I'm sorry. <laughs> My name is Camilla Henry, 3109 uh, Cunningham Lane, Douglasville, Georgia. Um, I'm also a part of the HOA um, of Tributary, with, along with Fielder, who's the treasurer, and I'm the second member at large. Um, and I also oppose the rezoning for Edge Connects. Good evening, panel. Good evening. My name is uh, Bobby Wilson. I live at 3196 Garden Hill Lane, Douglasville, Georgia, in a tributary community. I'd like to start off by saying that I oppose, I oppose this motion. Um, I think there's a pretty profound slide that Edge Connects presented today with all the logos on it, right? Think of all of the commercial logos on that slide. Think of the residential community around it. When does it stop? Um, I think that's the question that we, we kind of want to ask. Those of us who moved in that community, we saw that it's a pretty thriving community. We would hope Douglasville would like to reproduce what we already got, right? And uh, I would think the more commercial that you put around it outside of retail, the more you're probably going to strangle the life out of it. Right, And so I, I just want to say more rooftops, more retail. That's what we're looking for there. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good evening, uh, council members. My name is Tavares Jones, 3211 Ancoat Street. Uh, I oppose this measure uh, for several reasons. Uh, one of the things that we brought up in uh, one of the initial sessions when we started talking about this was the environmental impact from the substation, uh, the amount of power that is required for a, sub, mean for a data center, uh, I work in the power generation industry and I see some of these places go up. Uh, they're going to get this from Georgia Power uh, some kind of way, but I've seen where you had to build full power, full power plants in order to uh, power these things. Um, this substation might be enough for the initial building, but what happens in the future when they want to use the rest of the land? Are we going to have to look at bringing in a power station? power plant uh, and then you have to look at the water consumption um, 
there's a lot that goes into powering something of this magnitude. Uh, once again, I oppose and I uh, just wanted to make that known. Um, also, I'm concerned about the home values. We should be going up. Uh, when you look at the homes in the, in the tributary, Palmer Falls, uh, these homes should be increasing in value, but um, we're fighting for our square footage, the price per square foot. So um, I don't think this helps in the least bit. Thank you. Thank you, sir. How much time do we have left now? Mr. Chairman, we have two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Susan Kreitz. I live at 9970 Devonshire Street in Douglasville, Georgia, 30135. I'm also a resident of Tributary. I'm opposed to um, this entire thing. We find ourselves standing here often um, before you having to oppose warehouses, data centers. Um, there's just, a, as uh, one of my neighbors said, there's too many logos on these slides that we see. That's not how we envisioned where we wanted to live when we moved here 15 years ago. Um, we're done with that. Um, you know, it, these the promises of whatever they were that these extra incentives that they're trying to offer um, without basis are also a little disturbing to me. Um, you know, I don't have an electric vehicle, so that doesn't really matter to me. Um, I'm from New Jersey. I don't want to see a Jersey wall up on Riverside Parkway so that we don't have to see a power plant or a power substation. <laughs> we already have another power substation across the road. We don't want any more. Um, we want to see rooftops, we want to see houses, and we want to see retail. We don't want to see a data center. Thank you, ma'am. Is there a meaningful amount of time left for anyone else to go? Uh, we have about 30 seconds left. Anybody, anybody want to get in in 30 seconds? Okay. All right. Well, that. <laughs> I will, at this point, I will close the uh, public hearing portion of this uh, meeting. Um, I will say I'm impressed that everybody did follow fairly well follow the rules that the mayor had stated of not being repetitive in your arguments. So that was very impressive. Um, I will turn this back inward now and, and come back to the city council and, and, and go back to those who deferred a comment from earlier and see if they would like to make any statement at this time now. No comments at this okay. time. Mr. Davis. Councilman Estes. I wish I could say the same thing. <laughs> Um, first of all, thank you to both sides of this. Um, Edge Connects and, and this group have, have been very open and willing to, to talk with the community and that is very much appreciated because it doesn't happen every time. Um, so thank you for that. Um, and to my Neighbors who showed up in force, thank you for speaking your mind and letting your voices be heard. Um, we need to hear from, from our citizens when we are facing difficult decisions, and this is a difficult decision. Um, I understand the concerns of the residents um, I share some of them, but not all of them. And um, I also understand the, the plans for the data center and, and the potential benefits of, of that. So I am, I am very much torn on this, um, but hearing from, from both sides has been very helpful. Um, and I appreciate that. Um, I honestly don't know what to say at this point. I've got a lot to, to think through. Um, and I'm, I'm available for anybody who wants to follow up with anything else. Thanks. Thank you, Councilman Estes. Madam Mayor, do you have any? 
I just no, thank you so much, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. I just echo really what uh, Councilman Estes has said. Thank you all to the community for coming out, taking time out of your lives to come out right before the holidays in the cold to come and express your concerns and um, letting us here so that we can put this into the equation as we decide um, on what we're going to do on Monday. And thank you so much to the applicants for coming forward and making concessions and um, and extending an invitation uh, to have conversations with the community. We appreciate that. And we appreciate your interest in wanting to invest in the community. If um, this doesn't work out, don't go, don't take your uh, marbles and go home. We ask you to come back and find something else if this does not work. Uh, we appreciate your time. Thank you all so much for everyone. Thank you, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I guess uh, I wish I had something pithy and profound to say at this point, but I don't. Um, however, I do appreciate that everyone did come out. Um, uh, this is what participatory democracy is all about. And um, your opinions are, are well received and, and certainly welcome. Um, this is how we make the decisions. We, we all want economic development in our community. I don't think there's any dissension from that concept. Um, but we also want development that meets our requirements for our quality of life. Um, and what we have to consider under each of these issues that come before city council is what does that do to the net sum loss or gain in that level of quality of life that we seek. And as we make these decisions, as folks come before us and apply to, and they present their businesses and their, and their ideas, um, each of those has to be looked at and judged individually. We, it's, we have to have a vision overall for the community, but does that issue, does that application fall within that vision? And sometimes there's, it's not a cut, you know, black and white issue. There's a lot of gray in there as well. So um, especially thank everybody for their comments. We thank you for your appearance alone. So um, this item will be presented on our agenda for Monday, in which we will take a vote to either approve or deny that application. Um, and at this point, we'll close the, we already closed that, so we will now move on to the next item, which is in relation to mm -hmm. the first item, which is item B, and that is to hold a public hearing and consider a request for plat approval for the purpose of subdividing for approximately 95.11 acres on Riverside Parkway and Roberts Road in Landlot 169, District 1, Section 5, Parcel 4, application by Tributary Land Partners, LLC, care of Adam Richards. Ms. Shayla Reed will provide some information for us. Greetings again, council members and mayor. Um, the item before you, as mentioned, is relative to the first item. Uh, the parcel of 95 acres, 95 plus or minus acres, uh, they're requesting to divide or subdivide the parcels into two. Um, that would be 52.75, 42.30. Um, those two particular parcels will be separated. Um, so again, those actions play a part with each other. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Does the applicant have anything to add to this uh, request? Okay. Hey. Good evening, Mayor, mm -hmm. Council. My name is Adam Richards. I am with Tributary Land Partners. Um, and I just wanted to answer address as well. I'm you sorry. and address together. Oh, address, address uh, is 3490 Piedmont Road, uh, Atlanta, Georgia, 30305. Thank you. Um, so really just wanted to come up, answer any questions that you had. If you have um, the Platt subdivision uh, map in front of you, I think you can pretty clearly see it's a natural dividing line along a stream and sewer line that run through the middle of the property. So uh, this has really been the intention all along they're they're really two separate kind of i guess fillets if you want to call them that two almost circle uh type properties and they have different topography um and really are suited as kind of two separate tiers um and so with with the edge connects project um they would uh go to the riverside parkway section so we would need to subdivide the property uh, f for them, for their initial phase. Um, and really, our um, thinking all along is let's keep these uses consistent with each other 
uh, for this parcel and for the surrounding uh, uses. So if we were to go subdivide the property and Edge Connects takes the 52 acres, we then have a 43 acre remaining property that's still zoned for multifamily residential. So to us, that just seemed counterintuitive. Um, why would we want this residential in such close proximity to these other, uh, uh, you know, data center or surrounding industrial uses? The 43 acres, if you remember from that uh, aerial, is right next to the Douglas County zoned uh, land, which includes, I think, three or four parcels plus the uh, sewer water facility back there. So. Um, that was kind of the main reasoning behind it is let's keep this consistent. Uh, on top of that, and probably the most important, is Edge Connects will not purchase the other property without this being part of the rezoning because they want to know that their future is solidified for expansion. They don't want to come back down the road when they're ready to expand onto this land um, and try to seek uh, another rezoning. Um, or if another user comes along, we felt like it was a consistent um, use next to that data center. Uh, another point is the substation. This substation, Georgia Power has, has spent who knows how much time collaborating with Edge Connects. Edge Connects has spent a lot of money on this with Georgia Power. You know, they've got to do feasibility studies. So their feasibility study and the way they size this data center um, and to the way they can I guess, uh, make sense of the data center and the investment that it takes, takes into consideration the remaining land as well for future expansion. Um, let's see. I think I mentioned everything. Thank you. Happy to answer any questions. I will again turn to Madam Mayor and Council. Mm -hmm. Any questions or comments? That's Coach good. Watts. Councilman Davis. Councilman Estes. Okay. All right. Again, this is a public hearing. You, we've gone through the rules. 20 minutes, five apiece or less. Um, again, we will begin with those who would like to come down and speak in favor of this, uh, this uh, application and do so at this time. And I will give you quite as much time since we, from previous history. All right. Then uh, I'll close the portion of those who would come and speak in favor. And now those who would like to speak against may come down and present your case and please don't disappoint us on the repetitive part that we already you've made us so proud about All right. well seeing that no one who would like to come down and speak either for or against we will now cl close the public hearing portion of this uh, uh, application I'll give one more opportunity for Madam Mayor and Council if they would like to say anything else at this time okay Sorry. All right. Well, this will be taken uh, up in cons consideration on Monday in conjunction mm -hmm. with the first applica application item. And we will now move on to item C. Yes. And there's a moment where people want to get up and leave, and sometimes can be disturbing. <laughs> I'll let you do that. <laughs> Not approval. <laughs> Item C, I'll read it as, as listed on the agenda, but we'll correct it after I finish reading, which is hold a public hearing, consider a request for plat approval for the purpose of subdividing for approximately 12.085 acres on Bill Arp Road in Land Lot 160, District 2, Section 5, Parcel 19, application by Rochester and Associates, LLC, in care of Brandon Register. Um, this is not a public hearing, since it is a plat approval, it does not require public we, We've caught it. We're going to correct it for Monday. Okay. Was that a, then we shouldn't have had one for B either? Is that okay? We, we weren't going to interrupt you. We're going to fix it on the back end. All is well since nobody bothered about it. Okay. okay. All right. So uh, minus the, the public hearing, uh, Ms. Shayla Reed, would you like to present this item? Yes, sir. This is a plat where the um, applicant is asking to subdivide the land 
Um, there is a, um, the parcel has vacant land associated with it and they're looking to subdivide for the sake of any future endeavors, whether it be purchase, sale, whatever it may be for the parcels. And staff has reviewed and recommends approval of this item. All right. Is there anyone present who would like, is, is an applicant um, he is. here? Yes, sir, he is. Okay. Chris Rederson, uh, 3500 Piedmont Road, Atlanta. Uh, worked for Site Centers, the landlord. Ms. Reed said everything exactly right. We're just looking to um, create optionality with some of our single tenant out parcels at some of our shopping centers uh, for future financial tra transactions. But here, if there are any questions. And this is the, the just the parcel where that includes the Popeyes. Is that it's right? just the Popeyes, just yes. The and the separated out from the and the, the parking that goes along with it. Yes, okay. uh, and that's, that enables you to develop it in a different way down the road. Is that the purpose of that? Or? No, in, in fact, uh, right now we have no current plans um, with regards to this replat. In fact, we we're pursuing this uh, endeavor with with regard to single tenant out parcels at roughly 30 of our shopping centers across the United States just uh, for future optionality. If, if um, as she said, we wanted to refinance, uh, sometimes a single tenant, uh, it's easier to get some refinancing on some of those ground leases and, uh, and or if we were, uh, needed capital, if we didn't want to sell an entire center, if we wanted mm -hmm. to sell a ground parcel with X amount of term, it leaves that optionality, but that, no I, current plans here. I see. Okay, so that enable, it, it's an easier way. You, you've got the land prepared at that point if you do wish to sell it in the future. Yes. You don't have to go through the application process at the time. Yes. Deal with time constraints. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, any questions from Mayor? Matt? No red beans and rice. You don't want to bring anything. Uh, I, I, bring I, <laughs> I do love some Popeyes, but but I, I, I vote for Publix fried chicken over uh, sometimes. <laughs> but bo both are good. <laughs> yes, sir. Just kidding. Thank you. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Mayor. Any other questions or comments from council? Okay. All right. Well, uh, seeing none, we and being that the chair is not here, I, I, otherwise I'd mm -hmm. probably put this on consent agenda, but uh, we'll save it for Monday and vote on, take a vote on that item at that time. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Next item is D. If I lose track here, let me know. I hope I'm reading the right no, one. No, you're doing well. <laughs> okay. Well, hold a public hearing, consider a request for plat, hold, for plat approval for the purpose of combining uh, approximately 9.77 acres on Chicago Avenue mm -hmm. and Van Zandt Mill Road in Landlot 224, District 2, Section 5, Parcels 28 and 34, application mm -hmm. by the Benoit Group, LLC, in care of Raven Thompson. Again, I assume this is not a public hearing, so we'll strike that from the beginning of that section. And Ms. Shaley Reed, you'll do the that. presentation. Yes, sir. Um, the applicant has requested to table this item, and so we will yes, defer to them for the date that they're asking to defer it to. They're asking, they're asking that it be tabled. Yes, sir. Okay. All right, so I guess to the meetings. You have two meetings uh, remainder for the calendar year. Um, your meetings okay. in December are December um, 1st and 5th or December 15th and 19th. Have they requested Have they requested which particular day they would like to have a table? They were, we're deferring. They're at, uh, looking into it now. First and fifth. First and fifth. Could you, could you come up, please? Joe Fowler, Post Office Box 49 in Douglasville. I have the pleasure of representing the Benoit Group with respect to the apartment complex mm -hmm. that's proposed on Chicago Avenue. We've got some issues to work out with respect to the plat combination with parcel number 13 of a little subdivision that's up to the north behind Golden United Methodist Church. We're almost there. We just ask you to put it on the agenda for December the 1st and 5th both this and the following item, which is the development plan, Mr. Okay. Chairman. So this item and then the following item are the request They're linked is, together, yes, sir. Okay, the request is to table those two. There are meetings of December 1st and 5th. Okay, that's how the um, uh, proposal will be read on Monday. Uh, so I will go through those since we didn't read it. I will go ahead and read item E then, um, which is tabled from November 7th, 2022. Consider a request for development plan approval for the Astoria at Crystal Lake Senior Living Development for 9.77 acres in Chicago Avenue in lands lot, land lots 193 and 224, District 2, Section 5, Parcel IDs 0224025 and 0224 for plans dated September 7, 2022, application by the Benoit Group, LLC, Marcus Thompson. All right. Marcus Thompson, uh, city engineer, 6701 Church Street, Douglasville, Georgia. 
So as the applicant um, previously mentioned, this item does correlate with um, item D on your, on your guys' agenda. So we would like to um, table it okay. as well. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Madam Mayor, comment? Yes, sir, I do have a, I have a question, actually. Um, yes, ma'am. We had at our last meeting, well, not the last meeting, but anyway, we tabled it to the 7th, I thought, um, tabled from the 7th. And I thought it was an urgency to get everything done by the end of November. So what what happened? Why are we now going beyond November to through December yeah. if we had to get it done right away? Oh. All right, if you can give us your name and address for the record, I appreciate it. Raven Thompson, mm -hmm. representing the Benoit Group, address 6780 Roswell Road, uh, Sandy Springs, Georgia. Mm -hmm. um, Greetings, Mayor, Council Body. Um, so basically, we attended November, I came November the 3rd with my mm -hmm. team, um, and it was recommended that the project be tabled till today. Right. Um, in that, so with that being said, we did not come on the 7th because, as I understood right, it, if 17. it was going to be tabled, we didn't need to be present. Right, right. Yes, ma'am. So um, in between that time, we did receive some plaque comments back from um, the legal team and mm -hmm. uh, the development team. And so um, as it stood in their comments, um, because of the landlocking situation as it related to parcel 13, which was not included in the uh, final plat that was submitted, the final plat mm -hmm. survey. We only included the actual two parcels that the project would be constructed on. Um, and the 13 parcel will revert to the church at closing. Um, and then that parcel will be combined with the church's parcels, which are parcels 5 through 11, uh -huh. which is um, north of the actual project site. And then the other parcel in question was parcel 12 that was owned by the County Board of Commissioners. Mm -hmm. As I understood it, um, we, re we did retain Attorney Joe Fowler, and as I understood it, he and Mr. Dotson had worked out, um, well, let me back up. So, yeah, so they worked out um, us communicating with the County Board of Commissioners to get a letter um, drawn by them and signed by them that mm -hmm. they did not care about the landlocking and that they would work with us on acquiring that parcel 12, but it would take a little time because of their processes with advertisement, et cetera, that it would have to go through. Mm -hmm. But we took in good faith that with that letter um, and their um, understanding that, you know, it would be okay to do in addition to the church also wrote a letter about their um, consolidation of lots and um, them not, you know, having a big issue about um, the landlocking situation because we knew that we were working behind the scenes to go ahead and get those lots consolidated to at least get the process started. Um, but as I understand it from the plat comments and um, the back and forth with Miranda, that as a result, it doesn't matter. I mean, you, your ordinance says what it says. That's understood. So at this particular point, we were told that the plat would not be approved or they would recommend that it would not be approved. Mm -hmm. um, and so it kind of just gave us uh, at the, we had to huddle back up to kind of say, hey, we need to try to, you know, find a better solution um, so that we can be able to come back and try to work with um, the city development team, et cetera, so that we can have an amicable agreement with everyone as it relates to, you know, those two particular parcels. Okay, so the two parcels in question, you said it's 12 and 13. Yes, And you had five. Do you own 5 and 11? So 5 through 11 is owned by Golden Memorial Church. Okay, that's the uh, church. Golden Memorial parcel. Church, again, is G partner in our general partnership for the transaction for the actual Astoria at Crystal Lake. Uh -huh. um, and the uh, site that we were purchasing uh, is actually the three parcels, which is parcels 13, uh, wow. track two parcels 34 and 28. Okay. Okay. Um, Again, that a portion of those parcels would go for the project itself, and then the remainder that we did not use for the building footprint will mm -hmm. revert back to the church. So do you own those lots that you're So speaking? we have parcels 13, uh, 34, and 28 under contract. Okay. The owner of that land um, is uh, Francis and Joe Thee. Uh -huh. um, and so we do have a signed contract with them to purchase the land under our general partnership. And mm -hmm. then 
like I said, parcels uh, 13 and whatever additional parcels that are outside of the building footprint would go mm -hmm. back to Golden Memorial Church. And 12 is Board of Commissioners. Yes, ma'am. And so they the have Board of Commissioners, they have agreed. Do have, we don't have anything. So I mean, we, we don't pro have I a provided letter from them. the letter to um, the development and zoning. Uh, we did provide it, Shayla. Uh, we did send a, a letter showing the uh, County Board of Commissioners oh, uh, signature as well as the church's letter. Okay. So they approved to give the lot or to sell the lot? Or? Yes. Oh. We did. Okay. The letter simply said the commissioners didn't have any problem with uh, the city closing the road. Okay. It, th that's, I assume you all are trying to buy that lot from the county. That is correct. It's so confusing. It seems like you're landlocking, but you don't have the land to landlock. I mean, you don't own it right, right so now, so story. you can't tell somebody the Lots land. Lots 5 through 11 are okay. owned by Golden United Methodist. Uh -huh. And then here's Golden United Methodist over here, right. fronting on Simpson Road. Jason, losing his name for a moment. James Simpson. I know you're talking about. <laughs> and then it hits Chicago Avenue. Yes. The apartment complex is going to be built largely on the property that's on Chicago Avenue, mm -hmm. and it goes up to the last lot of 5 through 13. Mm -hmm. 5 through 11 are owned by the church. Mm -hmm. They're platted separately. And so the church is just going to combine those, which means those lots are not landlocked. Even though mm -hmm. they're owned by Golden United Methodist, they're right. separately parceled. So they're going to combine all that into okay. one big track, leaving 12 and 13. They're buying 13. Mm -hmm. It's just not on the plat that you have before okay. you. So that's a little technical correction. Lot number 12, however, would be landlocked from Chicago Avenue. Uh -huh. There is no road there, but there's a right of way called Van Zant Mill Road mm -hmm. that has been the dedicated mm -hmm. who knows when, but it's just grass or trees or something. But if you put the apartment complex over Van Zant Mill Road, mm -hmm. number 12 is landlocked. Okay. So we talked to the county. They had a public meeting, and they said, we do not care. Okay. <laughs> you can put the apartment complex there. We don't care. Okay. And we can also buy it. Mm -hmm. But the problem is they may have to go through the public abandonment process mm -hmm. for us to be able to buy it. Mm -hmm. And that was Miranda's concern because that process, though they're willing to do it, is not completed. We may not be able to complete it by December the 5th. Yeah. So how come you can't buy everything and then come back and ask us? Why didn't we buy, buy it? Or? Purchase all the lots and get all that approved before you come back and ask for us to approve everything. We never dreamed that we would need to buy okay. 5 <laughs> through 12 because the apartment complex can be built there. Nobody ever dreamed that Van Zant Mill Road was a problem, but your okay. staff noticed it. I see. It's city right of way. Mm-hmm. But I suggested it might work in the grand scheme of things is go ahead and grant the land disturbance permit, approve the plat, approve the development plan, but before you give them a final CO, they got to buy the lot from the county. So that all of this could be approved, the apartment complex can go forward, mm -hmm. Golden United Methodist people would be very happy, <laughs> but the final CO would be contingent upon our closing on the lot with the county. Miranda, I talked about that. I hadn't talked to Joe about it yet because I've been working on a rezoning on Riverside Parkway. Oh, just a little something. Uh, okay. But that's a possible way of working it out. And Don't that violate our ordinances currently? I can't give an opinion about that. Okay. Well, let me leave that alone. So the initial question, I'm just trying to understand why we're waiting until December 1st, is that I thought the 31st or the end of November was the deadline. Because this isn't a DCA, or don't you have to have some points or something? We have before? to have an allocation from the Department of Community Affairs, and we have that. But okay. we've now arranged it so we can close in January. We've already filed the bond validation. Mm -hmm. That process is moving along. The hearings are scheduled at the latter part of this month, actually. So we're going to be okay with respect to that. Our allocation is safe. When you were told initially we had to have it done by the end of November, we didn't have that yet worked out. Mm -hmm. That's been done by the bond council. Okay. Where we are right now is just trying to deal with this little island of a problem, Lot yes. 12, that the county got in a tax sale in 1928. Oh, my gosh. And it's just holding the world together.
So if they open it up, don't they have to advertise and have people bid on it That's and then the sell it to you? Is that going to be done in two weeks? or how, when is it? I don't think it can be done in two weeks. It, it's the same way that they, they have to dispose of property the same way that the city does. Mm -hmm. uh, I, they, they have a, I don't know how much acreage you're talking about, but chances are it's, it's above the, the, what you would call a surplus property. 1.1 mm -hmm. acres. That they would have to make a determination that they want to expose it for sale. Mm -hmm. And they would have to get an appraisal and ascertain what it's worth. Oh, wow. Then they would advertise for bids just like we do. So process we, like that usually takes a minimum of 60 days, but often longer. So we have an appraisal. The county had a public hearing on this on okay. October the 4th and said, we're ready to sell it. And we're just in the process of working through that. We thought we hoped we could have, have it worked out. By December 1st. I don't know that it can happen <laughs> okay. by then. So we may have to leave it on the table. Unless you grant it subject to yes. letting us have the LDP, but no CO. And legal staff would have to make okay. a determination about that. I understand better. Sorry, it's Thank complicated. You. No, no, no. It's, it, it helps to clear it up for me. Thank you. That's a lot of questions. I apologize. That's Thank right. you. Any other questions Martin. or comments? Joe, you've had a very busy night tonight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Um, any other comments from any, anything else left from our attorneys that wish to? Any comments? Nope. Okay. Look like you're about to say something. Okay. All right. Well, then uh, I guess we will place this on the um, uh, main agenda for mm -hmm. Monday to be voted on as to w whether it will be tabled or not to the meetings of December 1st and December 5th. Thanks, okay. okay. Thank you. Um, the Thank applicant, you. Madam Mayor, that is all we have tonight that's all? under Planning and Development Committee. Unfortunately, <laughs> I hope we had more, but that's it. Goodness. So. Okay, we'll move on expeditiously. Uh, Public Improvement and Beautification Committee, I'll ask the committee uh, participant or member, Coach Watts, to please take this committee. Yes, ma'am. Uh, actually, we have no business tonight under public improvement and beautification and Councilman, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, uh, Councilman Adams would be proud of you tonight. Good job. I know it, I know it. So we'll move on to Public Relations Committee. The Vice Chair is Council Member um, Samuel Davis. I know Councilman Estes stepped out, so I'm asking you as the Vice Chair to take this committee, please. No business at this time, Madam Mayor, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Councilman Davis. This is your committee, Public Safety Committee, chaired by Councilmember Samuel Davis. Yes, ma'am. Item A, <coughs> have one item. Mm -hmm. Adopt an ordinance for amend section 10, 2018 10 107 and 10-151 of the Code of Ordinance of the City of Douglasville for the purpose of moving the due date of the excise tax from the 10th day of the month mm -hmm. to the 20th day 20th day of the month to amend section 10-1.8 of the code of the ordinance of the city of Douglasville to allow for city council discretion as to the item of an interim of probationary polling license mm -hmm. to amend section 10-23 of the code and ordinance of the city of Douglasville to allow for a percentage-based late fee of amount for alcohol license renewal to repeal and conflict an ordinance to provide an effective date and other purposes. Ms. Ooh. Jordan. Good evening, Councilman Davis. Down first. Um, Mayor and Council. Mm -hmm. So we reviewed back on November 3rd mm -hmm. the, uh, the changes that are being proposed for this ordinance. Um, some of the changes that were discussed at that committee's meeting are not part of this ordinance change. The ordinances that are listed here for, for this particular change are pretty much housekeeping items. Ms. Callan had reviewed for the 10-28, 10-41, 10-107, and 10-151. Those all mentioned a um, due date for excise taxes being changed from the 10th to the 20th of every month. So the only changes that were made relate to just that that date change during the month and that was again to match up with state re, um, reporting requirements so that it's easier for our businesses and for our finance staff as well the item 
10-148. Um, we ran into this a few months back with the interim license that was granted for a crew lounge, and mm -hmm. there were questions that were presented by council at that time. Did we have to stick to 180 days for that temporary or interim license, or could there be some flexibility to grant maybe 90 days, 120 days, mm -hmm. anywhere in, in a range? And so this ordinance is being proposed by staff to give council the discretion to grant a license for a temporary license for whatever term that council sees fit for that particular situation. And finally, the section 10-23, uh, currently the, there's a late fee of $500 for alcohol, all alcohol licenses. But a beer license, a wine license are $500, whereas a liquor license is $5,000. So the establishments such as grocery stores that just serve beer and wine or just provide sales for beer and wine are basically having a 100% late fee, and the liquor establishments have a 10% late fee. So to make it equitable across the board based on the cost of that license, mm -hmm. staff has proposed a change to make it a just flat 10% late fee. Mm -hmm. Do you guys have any questions? Thank you, Ms. Jordan. We already went in discussion with this earlier before uh, where it was presented, and uh, Madam Mayor, I'd like to put this on the consent agenda for Monday. I don't see any opposition. Okay, thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Councilman Davis and Attorney um, Miranda. We'll move on then to the next committee, which is Recreation, Culture, and Tourism Committee. That's chaired by Councilmember Chris Watt. Thank you, Madam Mayor. We have no business night in Recreation, Culture, and Tourism. Thank you, sir. Uh, Technology Committee, chaired by Councilmember Mayor Pro Tem Terry Miller. There is no business tonight under the Technology Committee. Thank you so much, Mayor Pro Tem. I'll ask you as the Vice Chair to please take Transportation Committee as well. Thank you, Madam Mayor, there's no business whatsoever under the Transportation Committee as well. Thank you, sir. We'll move on then to item number 17, which is other business. Is there any other business to come before Council tonight from the elected body? I don't see any. Then we'll move on then to our updates from our city staff. Our city attorney, Mr. Joel Dotson. No business, Madam Mayor. Thank you, sir. Staff Attorney, Ms. Miranda Jordan. No business, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Our Chief of Police, Chief Gary Sparks. No business, Madam Mayor. Thank you, sir. Our City Manager, Ms. Marcia Hampton. Um, just to those who are serving on the um, SDS Loss Committee, uh, we have a meeting on Monday. If you please check your calendar, you should have gotten a um, notice from Ms. Kristen Tate. That's all. All righty. Thank you so much, City Manager. Uh, we do have... I apologize. We do have um, the Cultural Arts Council's gala on Saturday for those council members and staff who will be attending. It's at 6.30 here at the conference center, and it's the gala and um, auction to raise money for the arts in the community. All righty. Uh, comments from citizens and delegates. If anyone is sustained the meeting and like to speak to us, please come forward. Give us your name and address for the record, and you have five minutes. Former Mayor Pro Tem, Councilman. Siegel. Okay, yes, sir. Your email is there. yes, sir. Okay, well, if you don't have any other comments, um, then not having anything else, this uh, meeting is adjourned. <laughs>